very much uh, for joining us here on Newsworthy. My name is Anubha Bhusle and over the last few weeks and perhaps over the last few months, the focus of my small tiny team has to be to give you simple, clear, facts first, science backed, empathetic information that doesn't mollycoddle you, that is unbossed, unbiased, non-partisan information that I believe is crucial and life-saving in a sense. In my conversation today, I am tackling a very tragic and still largely unnoticed fallout of this pandemic. Children and COVID-19, but also children who may have lost both their parents to this disease or may have lost one parent and the other is recuperating in the hospital. There is a lot of incorrect, and I beg your pardon, incorrect information doing the rounds on various social media channels about how you can help. And I think it is an absolute public interest and public good that we understand how adoption works in this country. It can't work via a WhatsApp plea, no matter, with, no matter how good a place it comes from. Uh, let me bring in Geeta Luthra. She's a Supreme Court advocate. She's someone who's dealt with adoption law in this country in a very robust manner and can really help us navigate uh, this, uh, this, this terrible fallout and uh, this terrible and tragic fallout. Geeta, thank you so much uh, for sharing. Uh, no, uh, I've been nice to hear the web if I can. Yes. So yeah, I want to start by a whole host of WhatsApps that are doing the rounds. Uh, they have come on many social media channels and they talk about minor children, maybe two to three year old, having lost both the parents. And the call really is for a plea that please adopt these children. And sometimes the messages come back and say that they have been adopted. I think it would be great if you can highlight and put it very, very clearly what is the legal process and perhaps how no child can just be adopted like that. So first to make uh, matters simple, if it's a family member who is adopting, then and the adoption is by a live relative who can give an adoption, then there can be a simple process of adoption deed under the Hindu law. And that's called, there is invocation before the fire by which what is called Dhatta Homan and a ceremony by which you can give the child in adoption. Now that is in maybe even five or 10% of cases. In most cases, you have to go through the regular procedure, which is prescribed under the Juvenile Justice Act. The Juvenile Justice Act is this, thankfully, this single window act, which has now come into being in, two, in the year 2000. And I think uh, the good part about it was that otherwise, there was only adoption for Hindus. After that, there is a secular adoption law in India. And um, the same act has been amended in 2050. Now, you know, sorry to interrupt there, yeah. but can I sort of ask specific questions that have come yes. in? Yes. Let's say yes. a child, let's say in a situation like today where a child has lost both parents the child is automatically not eligible or up for adoption, right? Yes. So, so 
you would have to not notify the police station or the child welfare committee and the child welfare committee then has to look at who can adopt in the meantime you can perhaps through the child welfare committee offer a foster home a foster family and have a foster child that perhaps could be an answer rather than adoption you so, cannot uh, you know Yes. Sorry, continue, Sorry. continue, continue, Gita. You want to adopt in this manner, an adoption under the law has to be either under the Hindu Adoption Maintenance Act or more likely as in 95 to more percent of cases under the Juvenile Justice Act. So there has to be a home study report. There has to be a child welfare committee. The Child Welfare Committee looks at the home study report. Home study report looks at the suitability of the parent or the single parent or the parent wanting to do what are called their POPs, PAPs, that is prospective adopt adoptive parent. And those parents have to satisfy this criteria. The first choice is to give in adoption to India thereafter to NRIs and people of Indian origin and thereafter for other inter-country adoption. You can't just pick up a child and say, I want to be a do-gooder and adopt a child. Mm -hmm. There is a procedure mm -hmm. and that procedure is a somewhat elaborate procedure, though streamlined, though now thoroughly streamlined, but we must realize that these days, even courts are not functioning very much. And therefore, even this streamlined procedure is in a difficult space. Uh, let me answer your next question, and then I'll go on more about the procedure, perhaps. So, uh, you know, um, the question is that these messages, as you rightly po possibly said, come from a good place, are, are, is a good Samaritan, wants to bring in help. So if an average citizen, let's say me, was to find in my neighborhood a tragedy like this has befallen a family and the child is, let's say, a minor and is alone, what would be my first course of action? What should I be doing the first thing? I think what I would do is notify more than the police, the Child Welfare Committee, because I feel even the police may not be aware, although it is our duty to inform either the police or the Child Welfare Committee. So find the nearest Child Welfare Committee. These are statutory committees that are set up. You go to the nearest Child Welfare Committee, make an, a request for giving that child a foster home as a go-between till you can apply for adoption or if you're interested if you are interested or you can apply for guardianship there are no shortcuts there are no shortcuts and now the law is very stringent you are put in a queue and your adoption happens in a queue there are however guidelines which say that the child's wishes will be determined. So if a child is comfortable with a cousin, uncle, or an uncle, or an aunt, or a relative, or neighbor, with whom the child has grown up in a community kind of manner, then most likely the child welfare committee would be able to place that child in a foster home. But there won't be shortcuts. Except, as I said, if the child's above five, I believe, mm -hmm. then the wishes of the child are also looked at. So I think that's that's sort of an important assessment. There are no shortcuts. This cannot be solved on WhatsApp. So please do not forward messages that are a plea for adoption of girls or then further messaging that the girls or the young 
for the young children have been adopted. Um, Gita, I spoke just a day or two ago to Anurag Kundu. He heads the Delhi Commission for Protection of Child Rights. Um, and he spoke in a similar vein, but he insisted how um, if an average citizen was to encounter a case like this, uh, a child line like 1098, there are many other helplines that have been set up by states. They should be called and informed. And in the meanwhile, you give supper to the child, you take care of them, you talk to them well. If you know of their relatives, you call them as well. Um, I am, uh, I think, because you have mentioned these words, perhaps it'll be useful for our audience to try and understand what these different words mean. What does foster care mean? What does guardianship mean? Um, what does institutional care mean? And when does a child finally come into an adoption ecosystem? India, the practice of foster homes is not as prevalent as I have seen in the West. So the procedure that we go through is, for example, if it's an inter-country adoption, there'll be a specialized adoption agency in India. And this will be also for intra-country adoption. And there will be a special uh, adoption agency in, say, the foreign country, say the US. And both uh, places, the specialized agency will keep the child, look after the child. The uh, agency abroad will have a home study report on it. If it's an Indian who in within India who's adopting, then also you will have a home study report. And then in the meantime, the child will be looked after by these specialized adoption agencies. Hmm. So this, what is an institution now in comparison? There will be, there are two kinds of children. There are children who need care and attention. In fact, all children need care and attention. But there are also children who are apart from needing care and attention, those who are in conflict with law, those who have committed crimes or offenses. Mm -hmm. So they are sent to separate homes. Mm -hmm. And the intention is that a child who is needing care and adoption, who does not have a, a home to be in, will be in a children's home mm -hmm. where because under the Juvenile Justice Act 2000, all these children were placed in the same home. Mm. And the problem was that they didn't want children in conflict with children who were innocent and not in conflict. Mm. So now they have children's home, which are for children when they have no place to go, a temporary shelter home as a temporary uh, secure and a more permanent home till they find a permanent adoption, adoptive home. Mm -hmm. And that is the difference that this is institutional. Uh, these are institutions where children are placed. Foster care is once they are temporarily placed mm -hmm. as an interregnum. Mm -hmm. and the permanent place will be once they are once they are uh, adopted in the meantime there is what is known as guardianship mm -hmm. until the juvenile justice act came into being except for hindus where there was adoption children were taken only in guardianship by all other religions mm -hmm. so um, 
that is the distinction between guardianship. But in today's day, mostly children are directly taken in adoption sure. as there is a provision for adoption. Otherwise, you give children in guardianship and then you go to a host country. If it is not India, if it's in India, you, you would in those circumstances continue guardianship. But if it's not in India, then you, uh, you go and adopt in that country. Sure. I think we can we can sort of skim away that aspect of it for the moment yes. because we're obviously looking at this issue and with the events of the pandemic. Uh, my question was that, uh, again, I'm, I'm sort of just putting out situations here because these are situations people are confronting. If as an average citizen, uh, I was to find a case of this nature, I was calling Childline, I was trying to get in touch with child welfare committees, but I've known the family, I've known the children, I am providing for them in terms of food, taking care, you know, sort of taking care of their mental health. What would be my status in that interim period? I can continue to do it without any sort of fear and I can continue to take care of the children for a couple of days, etc., uh, without any fear, right? I, uh, I would say you can, and the way the situation is, uh, even help would be uh, difficult to get, but you have to inform uh, both 1098 as well as I think the number that they have put out, which is perhaps 9311551393, and it. inform them. Hmm. You have to inform and you should inform the Child Welfare Committee. And to my mind, you, as long as you have put it out there, it hmm. is better that you are looking after the child rather than have the child in a children's home if you are known to the family and can care. But in the meantime, you would have to get some kind of foster home family certificate or organization by the child welfare committee so they were not in predilection of law of course but i think the these, bottom line is, uh, is sorry go ahead Gita. these sorry. are dire times and dire straits and to my mind if the child is being looked after if you have pegged it there you have informed the authorities they would also not have the infrastructure to be able to send the child to a children's home and especially if the child is old enough to be able to express that he's comfortable in that home your fear is misuse of a child your fear is sale of a child your fear is that the child will be in a state of trauma, may need psychiatric and psychological help. And therefore, you have to park it out there that here is this child with you. And you have to then take the legal steps to see the way forward. Hmm. Um, I am presuming uh, concerns of this nature and, of course, never at the level that we are confronting today happen after every disaster or every sort of natural calamity. But I think my question is sort of broader. My question is the pandemic has been on for about a year or, or a year and more than a year. Do you have any insight as to what's really happening with our adoption process as a whole? Has it been impacted as well? I'm presuming by the pandemic. I mean, there are there is there are lockdowns, which means parents who want to adopt cannot go to the state. Uh, there are also other restrictions. Is there any insight you have as to how the adoption ecosystem has been impacted by the pandemic? Um, I am sure it's badly impacted. The fact is that under the JJ Act, it can be a family court, it can be a civil court, it can be the district judge court. Under the Guardian and Wards Act and Hindu Adoption and Maintenance Act, it is the district judge who's the dis designated 
elected guardian court that can do uh, uh, can give an adoption it is it is clearly impacted because our courts are not functioning now one of the important processes is that adoption has to be quick has to be uh, absolutely expeditious because if it is not immediate then that bonding between hmm. parent and child may not happen there are children with disabilities sometimes what happens that if they've grown the disability can no longer be treated those children remain in the adoption agency okay. or in the specialized agency so in order to attend to all this these are cases which need to be done pandemic or not mm -hmm. maybe today may be a special mm -hmm. time because we are right in the course in the top of the pandemic but there are cases and right. cases i for one feel mm -hmm. cases with regard to adoption cases with regard to child custody are cases which cannot wait because the child will grow and move on and the bonding and the love he will be deprived of cannot be substituted and there will be parents which are just the past which because of the delay of the indian system will say we are not going to adopt another child if it's going to take so long we are not going to take a child from india if it's taking so long if i can't treat this child with disability and get him operated which had to happen sooner then i may decide not to take an adoption sure. so there are many issues but the only one thing which is that i believe kara yes. which is set up under the ministry has been doing a stupendously caring job and they started becoming pragmatic so our laws which were earlier non pragmatic have actually moved on i think they need to move a little faster. further and they need to move very much faster for example there is two months uh, of publication if it's a, a child under two years sure. and if it's above two years then four months but the entire publication everything has to be done expeditiously mm. i mean every day is important for that child and particularly you never know what situation this situation happened in tsunami this happened in uttarakhand floods and this situation has come in pandemic so we have to have perhaps something in place mm. to ensure that our processes do not get delayed sure. whenever there is a disaster of this proportion mm -hmm. so um also you you're sort of thinking for speeding up processes augmenting capacity there's just one final question uh, i have geeta and it came on one of our feeds i know that india's adoption system is now centralized and the way to go through uh, go to the into the adoption ecosystem for anyone who wants to adopt uh, is actually the kara is actually kara there are a whole lot host of messages and again comments from people saying can you guide us towards an orphanage can you uh, can you point us towards an orphanage we would like to adopt uh, what should the sort of communication to them be so the the best uh, thing is of course that kara and the ministry of women and child have a list of adoption agencies these specialized adoption agencies for india mm -hmm. and i think we should request kara to actually publicize them in a time like this mm -hmm. so that people are made aware and it's very easy mm -hmm. and so can mr kundu for example and the dcpr uh, for child rights mm -hmm. that both of them can place them in a public space maybe bring it out in such mm -hmm. a manner 
that people become aware that there are these places where they can go. Also, I believe the child welfare committees, mm. which have been set up throughout, some originally there were very few and mm. very um, well selected. Mm. I believe the they have to be publicized sure. and the selection process also should perhaps include the district magistrate of the area and should have a committee where there are persons of known NGOs associated so that uh, there is approachability in case of time or distress. And I think this is what we need to publicize. We have these systems in place, but many people are not aware that okay. there are there are published, approved list of specialized adoption agencies in India. Fair and there, the, the location of the children's homes, the location of shelter homes, and the fact that you need more shelter homes is something that the state should augment. Hmm. Um, I'll have to leave it here, uh, Gita, but uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, laying it out so clearly for us. And thank you for your time. I know we haven't been able to touch on children within the adoption system already who are obviously also being impacted uh, by the pandemic. Uh, Gita Lutra, thank you very much. We leave it here. If you've been listening, thank you so much for your time. I think uh, just to put it in perspective and in crux, Gita has said that there is no shortcut as far as the entire adoption process is concerned. You have to go through a legal process. But as an average citizen, as a citizen who's aware of what's happening around them, please take care of the children if you find a case like this. But please make sure that you do call Childline, you do call the Child Welfare Committee, or you do call helplines that are also present in various states. We'll try and publicize all of that and put all these details in our description. But remember, Childline is 1098, and it works with great synergy and in great sync with many state child protection rights organizations and Conditions. Thank you so much for your time. If there are any more questions uh, that you still have that I haven't managed to ask Gita, just drop them in the comments and I'll make sure we'll get you answers for that.